I want to ask one starting, couple of starting questions, and then start hand, handing over to the uh, to the folks who are raising their hands. Yeah. Uh, first, to gather all the knowledge that you have just shared, and a lot more that you have not shared today. Does everyone have to fly to Canada to take a course? <laughs> That's an excellent question, and I'm I'm very happy that you asked that because. i feel the reason i flew to canada to take that course is no longer valid i think with more people giving talks like this and stuff that gap is bridged but a place where i find i find this i find this really uh, confusing that there are these really nice technologies like css grid for example which is which is now a grid system that is beyond the scope of what i just presented and it's yeah. it's a very very sophisticated grid system that's in the hands of developers and where the gap i see there is scope for bridging is that how does one package the tool for designers so that they know how to leverage these capabilities because uh, i see a lot of these tools coming up like css grid and variable typography which are mostly in the hands of developers with no with, with no input that designers should use them so that's the only reason where i would feel like maybe it's good to speak that language a little bit and yeah so are you suggesting that designers need to learn a little bit how to code um i think there are more accessible things like say for example jen simmons makes this uh, this series of videos called layout land yeah so yes. in the topic of grids itself they it's a youtube channel called layout land honestly i i eat lunch to this this person talking about grids so how she speaks is she speaks about grids like this she speaks about this and then this comes here this stacks like this so the way she speaks is very very visual so you can actually find people who speak that language also i would say like if you now know want to know how to kind of like do grids or anything it's it's always it's always there it's available i feel somewhere but i just feel there's a miss that there are certain technologies that are written only for developers to understand but at the same time like for css grid the closest thing i've come to exploring that works for designers is webflow they have a very nice like uh, grid engine that you can you can kind of if you're a designer and you want to understand how css grid works and stuff you can kind of read uh, maybe see watch layout land and practice on webflow to just see how things work Yeah. Right. So, uh, for those who are asking, Jen Simmons is someone who is, I think, she is also a part of the the working group uh, uh, for CSS Grids, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yeah. Definitely very closely associated with the people who are building the standards uh, for design uh, related things. And she goes on around the world giving a lot of talks. And I think during the COVID time, she is making a lot of videos as well. Uh, so, uh, do follow Jen Simmons' work in this space. That's that's a very interesting. Uh, 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 she's a very interesting person to follow and all the information uh, that she gives uh, all right and uh, one more question i'll ask and then hand over to uh, others do you start with the designs first or do you start with laying out the grid first before you do the first shot and design i always uh, start with design first uh, for me it will it's always good to say for example the article detail page uh i kind of at that point it's i have this playground i would like you to just uh, elaborate what is article detail page it's a vocabulary that we comfortable with but not yeah so okay i'll talk about the article listing page that i spoke about earlier which an article li listing page would be any group of uh, similar content that's presented in a screen so it could be like a uh, a listing page could be a search result page which kind of lists out different types of content it could be a, a blog listing page where you're sh showing a lot of blogs together and stuff these kind of things when i know because what precedes the website grid uh, the grid part is a visual language presentation where i'm exploring like the visual attributes of the brand and seeing what typefaces kind of like uh, would work for it and stuff like that so you would want to kind of lock in your typefaces maybe your colors because if you're working on like black dark background versus white background the amount of space you might need would be kind of like different so i think it would be good to lock on like those physical like visual attributes like color typography a uh, brand elements all of those things 
before mm-hmm. you kind of like do the grid for sure do the grid bit okay uh, app makes sense to me and i hope the audience also benefits from this i start taking a few audience questions and later on come to a few of the other questions that i have we'll start with avani first avani i'm going to unmute you uh, so please ask your question hi hi everybody hi hansa hi <laughs> It was such a great session. Uh, I I got some amazing insights. Uh, I had one question. You spoke about prioritizing your design for a particular device based on the audience that uses that device. So uh, and you put like you showed us some graphs which had like really precise percentages of users on how many people used the desktop uh, and how many people used the mobile and all of that. So I wanted to know how do you go about finding these. statistics um how are they derived if they are the key uh, statistics based on which you define your approach to designing for a particular device and how do you go about that sure so that uh, usually uh, applies only for um uh only for website redesigns where the website has been around for years and years and we have access to their google analytics panel so these screenshots that you show are directly from google analytics which allows you to uh, which allows you to measure exactly how much how much of your audience comes from these different devices Okay. so it's it's and it's mostly for website redesign in a in a case where i'm doing a design for a company that does not exist at all the way that we would prioritize is by holding a discovery workshop finding out who's their audience suppose they are uh, like millennials or like you know and and they're uh, like or whatever like if they are certain kinds of users or if they are like really really um maybe in villages or something like that you always know that maybe they these are mobile only users you know they are not even it's not even mobile first users they are like literally mobile only users so the way that you might arrive at this could be either by guesswork through a discovery workshop or through actual data coming in from an existing website that you're redesigning uh let me let me add something to this answer as well uh because uh, having a data uh for a website that is there has been for a while uh has its own uh uh, uh you, i mean you will always take that with, with a little bit of a pinch of salt because uh, a pinch of salt because the data might be skewed because the design is not enabling mobiles to use uh, the site effectively and therefore more de- desktop usage is happening such a thing might also be possible so you should keep those things in mind rather than just taking that data and start applying that to your work at the same point of time it's also good to have to always keep a check on what the web trends are and there are lots of studies that are published every year updated every few months and all what is the percentage depending on which country you are designing for where the audience lies uh, what is the maximum like in india i think at this point of time about 65 to 70% of web usage is happening on mobile versus uh, only about 30% usage happening on non mobile devices uh, so such uh, data points you can have are there publicly accessible which you can also take as an input to decide uh, where you want to focus more got it awesome all right uh, so i will uh, uh, move on to the next question akshat akshat i uh, please go ahead ask your question hi akshat Hey, hi, hi, Hamza. Uh, all right. So, uh, my uh, really great talk, um, super insightful. Uh, so, my my question was uh, uh, actually about designing for IMAX and like the really big screens. Uh, usually, when designers do it, uh, they stop at laptops and desktops and not really design for IMAX. And it's mostly an afterthought a lot of times. Um, so, uh, I so I wanted one. and that really affects uh, from a developer point of view because like you mentioned the use case too i guess where the background stretches edge to edge uh, for example so now what happens is that the way if i'm designing my sections where i'm putting my container class directly affects how my backgrounds look uh, so uh, so and if after after the desktop design is done and then we do kind of a audit of the design on an iMac and we realize oh it's not looking good we need to uh make the section stretch from edge to edge the developer will have to literally remove containers and probably put it as a sub container like he'll have to refactor his code to get that 
um, uh, you know, design in place. So um, my question was that um, as a design process, is it recommended uh, or like, how do you go about designing for the bigger screens? Um, uh, like do, as a designer, do we need to have the discipline to always make sure to test your design on a bigger screen before handing it out to, off to the developer? Because otherwise there will always be this back and forth on, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, an added work that gets added after the design is done. Got it. Got it. I think that's a really good question. And I think I can answer with a, a particular slide also, which is say, for example, this right when i design so uh, one thing to do is like i can probably like give this as a sticker sheet also to just tell people to kind of just say that you know when you're designing like not this part but the case a case b case c so that like the next time you're designing with a designer you can probably show them these three things and ask how does how should your thing scale the usually b and c are not going to be an issue but when they're scaling with case a they might need to give you additional stuff as well so i think this would become this is a good potential for the sticker sheet for future projects for you but to just answer how i scale uh, i i work myself is anytime i'm kind of designing i have all of these four views always in my so even if I'm just doing like design on um, mobile on desktop, every page of mine has all of these four grids that are there. So sometimes what would happen is that I have a certain element that I know that it's going to scale to my large desktop in eight columns similar to this, but I just want to test it and I would just push it over there, test it and then kind of come back. So at no point am I only seeing one screen. It's always seeing like these four screens, even if I don't use them just to be cognizant of it. So I feel the two things and I completely understand your pain about introducing that wrapper after this thing. It's a proper pain in the behind so i completely <laughs> think that these things need to be solved for before and that's kind of why even this came to be like because <clears throat> i do notice that this is a problem a lot of people have mm. and um, yeah i think like to kind of show the screen to your designers and say tell me how the scales and to ask them to and if there are designers around to kind of always be cognizant about these four grid systems should be good oh, all right uh, so i think uh, uh yeah i think that really helps I, I really wanted to understand from you suppose you don't own an imac you can't afford one let's just take that as an example what's the recommended way for you to test your design uh, on an imac is there any recommended tool that you use uh, to do that I usually just zoom out like when I'm huh, laptop, okay. I just zoom out or uh, like if I'm if there's something specific or like if it's a Windows machine, I usually just ask a friend. I, I would know a friend who has a Windows machine. So sometimes color like especially grays, I have a mm. very tough time with. So I will send it to them. I'll ask them to take a photo with their camera and stuff like that. Like so a lot of this stuff happens when. And photo with the camera, does that work, Hamsa? <laughs> Once it was terrible because I used a shade of gray which I had like which I saw as gray but like because I was on a Mac and then the clients kept saying but this green that is there and I kept thinking they're saying gray wrong and then later on they told me they're actually seeing green and when they took a picture like the gray actually appears green so that was a huge lesson learned for me so for me it it, it really helps to just call someone who has like a large monitor and say, send me a screenshot from here. Like, so that would be the easiest way I feel. Yeah. Okay, and, and going, and, and going by the trends, I think the larger desktop uh, thing, uh, if you can ask for the grid right up front, that can be the best uh, way to make everything more deterministic as a handover from the designer, because uh, not just the large desktop, I think the tablets and many, the, the portrait and the landscape orientations that you talked about, Hamsa, many yeah. of these things become an afterthought. Yeah. Uh, 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 like, and and uh, I think the starting premise that you started off with, which is we do think of the mobile and the desktop design, is something that I would often question because I encounter lots of designers who start off with one, and that's usually the desktop. Yeah. And that's where you start and you're not even thinking the mobile because you're so focused in laying out and 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 getting your creative juices flowing for the desktop view 
that you you are not taking the mobile as a standard. So that itself, which started off as a premise, I would say is something uh, that needs a good degree of self awareness when you get into a project. That take these two things at least and start off always. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's an important bit. Uh, Tejas, let's take uh, Tejas. Tejas, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hey Hamza, I wanted to understand a little bit more about uh, if you could go back to those five or six columns of uh, different typefaces that you had selected. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> we have a session, hopefully on that. <laughs> oh, just give me a second. I'm sure, sure, sure. That. Ah, yeah. 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 So two things here. Uh, one. Ha- oh, sorry. Is it auto? Play? No, no, no. I by mistake skip. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so two things. Uh, one is, uh, how do your line heights and the, this block of typography and weight of it, like visual weight of it, impact your uh, uh, grid system? I wanted to understand a little bit more about that, uh, specifically your graphic. And second thing, uh, how how do you factor in the baseline grid and how do you relate it with your column grids? Okay, cool. So, um, so the first question is about like, how does the typography itself dictate the grid, right? So, um, a normal for reading the best kind of like amount of space to give us about 10 words, uh, 10 words, like a line, right? So say while these are all equal widths, if I had to kind of like uh, create like a 22 point size, which is what this is laid out on in the same width to have a uh, different to have 10 words each to fit 10 words each, all of these will have different widths. So that is one thing. And the other thing is that the line height over here, like when you uh, when you have like a little bit of a uh, a uh, lighter typeface that has a slightly more breezier line height, the amount of space you would need on the li- right and left of it become a lot more. Whereas when you look at something as condensed as this, which is, so the, the different attributes at play here are the font thickness, like uh, the weight of the font. So whether it's like a bold, medium, light, whether it, the line height is slightly like kind of cramped and suppose the, the letter forms itself, are they a little bit more like condensed versus a little bit more wider? So mm-hmm. when you have all of these three attributes and you you equate them, you realize that like when you squint your eyes and see, this kind of appears like a darker block than this block. So whenever it's a lighter block, you will need a little bit more space for around it. And hence this kind of dictates the gutters in which you lay them out. So because it's a denser block, you would need a slightly lesser um, gutter, but when it's like a, uh, like when you have a font, font that is slightly like lighter, you will have like a breezier, you will have a thicker gutter over here. Uh, quick, quick, quick follow up on this uh, bit. Uh, I have uh, Hamsa. Yeah. Is it also uh, uh, does this dictate how far someone is from the screen to comfortably read as well? And that is why the spacing between the blocks uh, can be. If you're too close, then then the spacing obviously appears more. If you're too far, then you need more spacing around it uh, to make to distinguish the two blocks of text. Is that also a factor? I think viewing distance would be a factor for sure. And that's why like when we're doing it uh, with uh, like, it would be a factor, but I don't know how much it would be a factor here. I'm seeing in the same viewing di- distance, two typefaces would have different gutters, like would okay, result. Sure. But maybe I'm saying that two typefaces automatically di- dictate what the viewing distance is going to be. So sometimes you pick a typeface and the viewing distance, someone will appear, will hold it a little away. Oh, and sure. if the- and the and the dense fonts you would probably bring it a little closer to read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also that's also how like uh, display typefaces and body typefaces work as well because of yeah. the doing distance and and that's why they used in slightly larger type size because display typeface don't have to have the heavy lifting of like um, of legibility as much as like the shorter the smaller typefaces need to have. Right. Okay. Another the question they just the, said. Yeah, yes. the baseline grid, right? Yeah, but I, I still had a like small follow up on the previous sure. thing. Uh, if you could go back. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So on this, I like this is a this is a really today I learned thing because I would think 
the exact opposite i would think like a heavier typeface needs little more gutter and little more spacing around it because it's already uh, very heavy like it on on that screen area it's already taking uh, looking a little bit heavier mm. so i i would i my assumption was that it, it was it would be exactly opposite like with heavier things you would need slightly more air around it versus say the typefaces which are already light mm. so if it's already light you could like be a little bit uh, uh a little bit tight with your margins and other spacing mm. okay okay yeah good good til now we can we can move to the next question about <laughs> and then how that relates with the column and margins and like your overall good okay so that's a really good question and and it's i have a slightly controversial opinion about baseline grids itself uh, i use uh, something so vertic baseline grids come from a print point of view and i uh, use, please explain the terms as well hamsa that would be great yeah. so uh, a baseline grid kind of helps you draw like uh, draw lines below like it kind of say for example a 4 pixel baseline grid would mean that your entire vertical height is divided into uh, rows of 4 pixels and every content that you have sits on these rows right so a lot of the way that baseline grids work is that uh, content sits only on these rows so that the the motive of baseline grids is that there is vertical rhythm now i was a, i am still a very heavy advocate of baseline grids for print because you're looking at the canvas in its entirety and you're kind of looking at your flipping pages and looking at everything in its entirety so i feel for things to sit exactly where they supposed to sit is an important thing for print but for web where i found a difference in opinion is that i like to use a modular scale rather than a baseline grid system where yeah. i'm creating vertical rhythm but i'm creating it with a modular scale and i will uh, i think a link uh, it, if you just google modular scale you'll see that um so suppose you go into say a uh, microsoft word right and you go into putting a type uh, like you start typing something and you want to edit the font size it even you open the drop down it has 10 12 14 16 etc it has all of these different type sizes and it goes all the way to 96 the reason that it has that is because uh, google has defined that that is the modular scale for all of its google products so the same way what i do is when i have a typeface like say for example i have i'm using railway for a project or roboto for a project or something new for a project i realize that the same scale that google is providing me or the same 12 16 24 scale that like you know life has provided me does not work too well so what i like to do is go to modularscale.com i think and calculate a scale that works really well for for my measurements so uh, so that's kind of that's why i don't use baseline for print basically if we were to replace the phrase like i think i used it wrongly if we replace the baseline the concept of baseline uh, grid with say modular scale so you have a vertical rhythm right Yes. Is there is there a way to utilize the same vertical rhythm or create a relationship between that vertical rhythm with your column grids, with your, like your overall uh, vertical uh, horizontal grids? That's yeah. That's a good question. So um, the only relationship that I would kind of build uh, in this in this thing is where if I want someone to read things uh, from left to right, I would keep lesser spacing between. the contents like this whereas when i want someone to read something from top to bottom i would i would spread out the horizontal space more and keep more tighter vertical spacing over there so that's the only way the reason i would do that is because of an intention that i want someone to read something or consume something in a certain way so if i wanted to do that the the way i see the relationship work and it's not consciously at work anywhere else the but the way i see it consciously at work is suppose the gutter then becomes that that thing for me to know that okay this is the space between these two if i use a space lesser than the gutter for a vertical thing that would mean that people will read this first instead of reading the horizontal thing first so for me it's more to do with like the relative what is the space i'm using 
vertically mm. rel- relative to the gutter spacing that is there understood understood so for example your line height is like say 32 pixel or something but your gutter is 24 right like yeah two columns is 24 but your paragraph line height is 32 pixel and then to maintain that you are also adding a margin at the bottom which is 32 pixel so your horizontal blocks are far apart than your vertical two thing two things stack next to each other okay yeah all right that's some designer geekery happening right there uh, <laughs> in, in between the questions okay uh, we are at 1216 we want to be ending this session in about 10 minutes or so uh if there are any final questions please drop a text to raise your hand uh, on on the chat or please raise your hand i have a couple of questions that i want to close up with one is that i want to uh, definitely take up uh, uh, or discuss that point which you started off with wherein you said that 12 columns start with 1200 pixel it's so easy to divide 100 pixels per column does it really matter that that uh, because eventually what we saw was you were directing everything from the gutter spaces and the margins and in some cases gutter and margins were also equal uh, in the desktop space as well uh, the columns just figured out for themselves right so can we make the 1200 pixel decision of whichever viewport you're talking about independent of what is actually the number of columns yes yes completely like i think it was more for the okay i should add that that easy multiplication was the purpose of this demo i think it yeah. would have taken something like 1366 or something or i wouldn't mm-hmm. yeah like it would be a little bit more complicated so it was mostly the 1200 was an arbitrary number taken for the purpose of this demo right so if you come down to that that slide where you had shown all the views and the ranges 500 and 6 to 6 uh, uh, to 900 pixels and stuff i think what there is one very interesting thing that i do want to highlight in that because that is something that we had learned and and discuss that also sometime uh, back in in a project that you were doing then next one where you show the width breakpoints defining the breakpoints yeah perfect so one of the things that in in these breakpoint decisions and i don't know how you go about taking this so please follow it up with uh, hamsa how you decide eventually where should the breakpoint be uh, you suggest a 900 pixel breakpoint over here five so there's one at 500 one at 900 one at 1200 at this point of time at least what i can see as breakpoints and what we had learned a few years back was a uh, pick breakpoints where a break in the screen is least likely to happen i'll i'll just invert it in a way that uh, when we started out doing responsive design we would always take 320 pixel as the mobile width and we would pick a breakpoint at around 320 to 360 pixel but what we realized and learned by around 2016 there was a very interesting article that had came out and they said that because devices vary a lot in sizes you can't pinpoint and say that a mobile width will end at 320 pixel or 350 or 360 it's better to not have a breakpoint where common device ends uh, better to have a breakpoint where a, where a device a standard device is least likely to end what that imply is a larger number of mobiles will fit into your mobile breakpoint and which is why a 500 a choice of 500 over here suddenly makes a lot of sense to me and instead of say 360 or 400 where lots of mobiles will start ending because 500 will safely take in all mobiles together in one of those things and as a result we have started doing our breakpoints at around about the things that that you have pointed out like around 500 or sometimes 600 and at around 900 at around 1200 or more rather than uh, the standard sizes of 320 pixel 768 pixel 1024 pixels which are the common points that we always used to follow earlier so is this a deliberate thing at your end as well uh, following the same principle or are there other reason for no i think ranges? this you forwarded that article to me in 2017 <laughs> i think that's how this uh, came from as well where um, like that article also made a lot of sense so i think this came from that project that we were working on together yeah, where yeah, yeah. Uh, i'll you... share the link of the article on the chat window just in case anyone wants to just further it's a really nice article that. very what, nice article what about using oh, sorry, sir. Yeah, using yeah, your go on, go. content as a how about using your content as a guide for your breakpoints uh yeah hamsa 
could you take that question i think this is mostly to do with uh, the thing is if you go into uh, the content bit over here like uh, i think the way that this would break like suppose the the 12 column thing the re, the where this entire principle would change is that if you have a 12 column grid if my 12 column grid threshold does not go down to 900 it goes down only to 1000 along with all of my uh, typography from mobile it the, it basically depends on threshold also so if you want to pack a lot more content over here but but your 900 is not going to allow the same layout to happen you need to kind of like tweak it and that's when you kind of put elements on this grid to test it to see whether that works and then kind of like take that call but this is basically to do a lot with the threshold of how your components can hold up in a grid like this so if i know that 1100 for example like sovik mentioned that 1100 or 1024 is that break point around which i need to break right so i want to ease down a little bit before that so maybe i will go up to like 1000 to kind of um, make sure that like this number could go on to 1000 just to make sure that this content is sitting well over here does that answer well they just there's also one more question hamsa on the chat if you can take a look sure. uh, so selvin asks is is alternate way where you start by defining total content area and then derive gutter margins in relation to that also a legitimate method I haven't tried that actually, but uh, I think for me it would be a little difficult to. I think it would be great to do that for single page websites and stuff. Or I'm just seeing my if I had to apply it, but for a website that needs to be like a design system where uh, I want developers also to kind of like take be a little bit more freedom once they have freedom free to kind of. dictate how things work and make the entire thing a little more predictable but i honestly haven't tried that approach so i wouldn't i wouldn't know the the way of defining content area and then defining the rest of it based on that uh, right makes sense uh, sometimes it's very hard to define a total content area i think that also might be a, a, a challenge in many ways uh, coming back to the breakpoints bit one of one other popular method Uh, earlier used to be start with the mobile and keep expanding it until your design breaks that's when you select the break point uh, so that is something that we never mentioned or talked about at this point of time so do you follow that idea at any point of time that uh, keep stretching your design and and introduce a break point only if required uh if i don't have any device priority of tablet like uh, in a recent project like tablet was a little bit of a priority uh, so and for that like i wanted to make sure that as much as i can function of this view as possible in the landscape and i wanted to intend it so that the portrait kind of uh, is working with the mobile thing because i knew this can scale down but if tablet is not a priority i would i would defer to seeing the threshold of how much the the designs individually can hold up for that thing but if we are thinking i would go about it more intentionally and say that if we are thinking about the whole system why not think about what that experience would be because once you start visualizing it there's lesser guesswork and i feel as a designer it might be better as the process because they can't visualize the the threshold live until they see it in code mm -hmm. okay makes sense cool uh, uh one more thing do you works still work with pixels <laughs> There's a lot of pixels that we are talking about, and what about the newer units that have come in in CSS? So yeah, I use like new, the newest unit I've used is CH, which is like the dictating the number of characters that you can fit into a content type. Like so, sometimes I I actually like put that the width of this should be uh like two forty CH, you know, so that I know that it's going to take uh the width is defined by like the content like uh, they suggested, but I I like. pixels because it allows me to kind of uh, dictate uh, whatever comes from here if i want to do it with viewport width or anything it kind of comes from this native understanding of okay these are where our devices lie and this is where it comes so i think uh, at least so far i have defined stuff like this like the breakpoints by pixels itself so do you do you feel that this is also a a, a way in which we are getting uh jailed 
to certain ideas that were uh, important before and the world is progressing just like the points as a unit has is something that has lots of designers really consumed because for the largest part of their work life they have been using that as the unit and then we have moved on to different units and from pixels also we are moving on to different units and maybe the next generation of designers will like hey, who uses pixels but you know i also feel like this is a development uh, thing as well so like suppose i am giving the hand off like this suppose someone gave me as a designer they gave me a hand off it would be my discretion also to say that okay this 500 pixels what if it is like 50 rems you know so okay. i i think it would be more like that because i actually define everything with rems in in my code Go but on. when i'm doing it in design for me the more native thing even though i'm familiar with rems as a developer is is like uh, pixels make make sense so what what hum, just to summarize what hamsa is saying uh, while as a designer you might still one of these uh, uh, very defined units like pixels which are static unchangeable not uh, not flexible and fluid units you might start with that when it gets translated into code then probably it should convert into relative units yeah. or or some of the more modern units is that a right summary yes first sure. okay got it uh, do you think that all design components all components that you're designing after you have decided the grids need to always map to the grids no <laughs> how do you how do you break the rule uh i think it's also to do with practice a lot uh, i wouldn't uh, i don't know how you can jump the thing of not adhering to it and then breaking even today if i had to break it i would first see if there's a way to work with the grid before i break it so uh for example i had a 12 column grid recently and i had to do a five column people page so in that the grid that i used was a custom one like or rather i just defined the start and end of that content type and said now divide this by five columns so i didn't literally use the grid but that's because i found the use case only in that page where it made sense to display five things in a in a grid from end to end so uh, that's the that's one place i also think that you need you cannot rely on that is one way of like where the where your ambition is greater than the grid but i also feel the grid is not enough like you need uh, you need max width you need min min height you need all of these things to make sure like your components are um working as intended even if the content in them are not as much as what was there when you designed it statically you know so i feel max width is really helpful for text where you want to make sure that the text like when you know um when i know that my font size is going to be 22 pixels and i know that it's going to uh, the word if for 10 words to fit it needs to be 72 to 720 pixels wide i wouldn't i would always set that width i would set a max width to paragraph so that when it scales up no matter how much if the grid scales to 900 my text will still be the text will stop yeah right absolutely makes sense uh so my last question which i am changing a bit because my question uh, earlier my question was about handing it over and and talking grids with the developer and you had given a very nice way in which a handover can happen with a developer it is by far one of the best ways i have seen uh, a a handover can come to us if we were developing uh, uh, a site so you've kind of addressed that question so i'll just change that a bit have you ever tried having conversation of grids with clients and has ever grids been a developer to a uh, 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 deliverable to clients and and how has that turned out if at all do Never. clients care about grids they haven't they don't know about the modular scale scale i use they don't know about the grid i use they have no idea like and and the fun part is like that's where most of the work goes you know like so for me like it's very invisible like the client because i don't expect them to have an opinion about it yeah so this this has mostly been something between the designers and the developers who have had to always figure it out yeah. all right thanks a lot we are almost at the end of our time and uh, for our session uh it's really really great to have you hamsa it was a fantastic session we are planning to do a few more sessions in the future uh, i am not like apple uh, who will keep everything under wraps until it launches uh, but i will also say that we are trying to figure out how can we have a typography related sessions uh, with hamsa and also maybe have 
in more involvement in, in that from other designers as well if any of you are interested beyond typography also if any of you are interested in knowing any other aspect of web design want to uh, pitch in our subject area where you can come in and have a conversation like how samsa did uh, please go to hasgeek.com/contentweb over there you can either put in a proposal you can also directly reach out to hasgeek or to me uh, and we can have a quick conversation because we are lining up these sessions from saturday every almost every saturday 